Welcome to the Open Education Network Summit. We're delighted that you are joining us for today's session entitled Fellowshipping with Faculty, Openness, Pedagogy, Advocacy, and Leadership in Idaho. My name is Tanya Groves, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Ed Network. If you're not familiar with us, we are a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. You can learn more about us at open.umn.edu forward slash OEN. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on, resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples, and we thank them for their persistence through a violent history. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you feel so inclined. I will be handing, handing this session off now to Wade Oshiro from Leeward Community College. Wade is a member of the Summit Planning Committee and an instructor for our certificate in OER librarianship. And he will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Thank you, Tanya. Um, as we begin this session, we'd like to share a few important details with you. This webinar is being recorded, and for that reason, uh, you have been muted. The video, the video transcripts and slides will be posted on the OEN's 2021 YouTube Summit playlist after the summit has concluded. And I'll drop the, um, the link into the chat here for you. The last 15 minutes of today's session will be um, for questions. To submit a question for our presenters, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We will not have a chance to ask all of the questions to presenters, but we will try our best. The chat will be a space for uh, you to share additional comments or reactions. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at z.umn.edu forward slash summit community norms. And I will add that to the chat there for your reference. The hashtag for the summit is OEN Summit 21. Also join us on Twitter at OpenEd underscore network. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters. First, we have Jonathan Lashley from the Idaho State Board of Ed Education. Anne Abbott from the University of Idaho, Anne Minervini and Michael Love, both from Lewis Clark State College, Francisca Borders from Boise State University, Joel Glad and Liza Long from the College of Western Idaho. And now I'll turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks, Wayne. Again, my name is Jonathan Lashley. I'm the Associate Chief Academic Officer for the Idaho State Board of Education. And all of the faculty who are here today from Idaho that Wayne just mentioned are just some of the cohort that I've been working with over the last oh, year and a half or so to explore concepts of openness, pedagogy, advocacy, and leadership. Uh, this was a pilot fellowship program that we launched statewide. And this is a chance for all of us to debrief and I think share a little bit of our work more openly with the community, but also reflect on uh, what lessons we learned over the last three months in terms of faculty learning and faculty development that you might be able to borrow from as well. So uh, as with any good fellowship, cue some standard pop culture reference here, but I'm not gonna linger on it too long. Rather, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what I mean by these fellowships that we refer to as the Opal Fellowship. Uh, this has been really, I, I come from learning sciences, and so I really appreciate uh, design-based research and formative design experiments, and in many ways this was one. This was an experiment statewide uh, where we were re remixing educative practices, goals, resources across institutions, across disciplines, and really focusing first and foremost on these things, these common commitments that we have to instruction in general, on the way toward open teaching and learning. 
And so what does that mean? Well, there's a theoretical foundation underscoring a lot of our work in the design of this program. And actually it came out of research that I conducted about at the time, the Open Textbook Network, but the Open Education Network back in 2018 and 2019. And there were many takeaways uh, in this research, but two that really resonated with me when I was considering spinning up my own statewide um, open education program for faculty was faculty motivation is our responsibility. And I say that as someone who, uh, I, I touch education policy. Our State Board of Education oversees um, K through 20 governance of our public institutions in the state. My work specifically, however, focuses on post-secondary. And before I came into my role in 2019, I often saw that there was a, a key disconnect in the implementation of policies where faculty weren't involved early, they weren't involved often, they weren't involved at the ground level. And importantly, uh, when someone in my position or someone like my, someone is in a position like mine, they would take the policy and say, here you go, and give it to the institutions and hope that the stakeholders of the institutions would know how to uh, engage, whether that was faculty, whether that was instructional designers, whether it was librarians, uh, student affairs folks, academic affairs folks, it, it ranged. And so for me, in, a, in my position, when I have policies and I have um, certain affinities that I'm trying to support on behalf of a governing body, or an authority structure, it's important to show that we also have skin in the game to get involved. And importantly, when you're trying to key in on motivation, it's important to understand that this is deeply personal, it's attached to a person's identity, and it's from this place of empathy and relationship building that it's really helpful to get started in terms of engaging faculty, recognizing that engagement with individual faculty members is going to vary. Secondly, these motivating values align when I'm also present to volunteer my own. And so when I talk about fellowshipping with faculty, uh, it's because I feel like all of us have had a very flat organization in the work that we've been doing over the last three semesters where um, it, it doesn't hurt that my background is as an educator and that uh, some of the courses that were being explored in terms of open resources and open practices are courses that I've also taught in Idaho. But it was really key, especially in the beginning of getting to know one another. And for me to model the practices that I wanted to see from the faculty I was working with, to share, to be creative, to experiment, to be open to failure, to fail fast and to fail together, and ultimately to just embody participation, the participation that I want to see and the engagement that I want to see. There were certainly times where I offered, I offered office hours where no one attended. But what was great is I could still use those as opportunities to work on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of the projects we were working on. And so I can't say enough about this setup because what you'll, what you'll see here, what's missing from this theoretical foundation is a focus on the materials and a focus on the generation and creation of OER. And really core to this initiative, and I, I said this out of the gate when we were proposing it, is that we're going to invest in people first. And in those investments in people, materials and resources and new practices that are shareable and scalable will, will probably result. This was my understanding based on the research I had done. And so when I talk about my responsibilities as a facilitator of this program, it was to facilitate the broad sharing that I wanted to see. It was to really shepherd the ways that the faculty I'm working with have agency, both enshrined in policy and also in practice by sharing with one another about what pedagogically is working in their classes, to celebrate whenever they were being bold, whether it, was a fail, whether it was a failure or a success, recognizing that just the effort of trying something new was worth rewarding and ultimately trying to inspire uh, these folks who are on the call today, as well as the others we've been working on, to really assume positions of leadership, to feel heartened in their expertise and in their learned experience of working together and collaborating together. Because the reality is the work that we're doing in open has a direct relationship with the work that many of us are already doing naturally as educators in our state. I thought this was I, this was a good excuse, this proposal or this presentation for me to go back to some of my research and actually a statement from this research. And the title of my dissertation at the time was "Our Educative Reticence." It's published in 2019, and then the slide decks will be shared after the summit. Um, there's a link directly to it where you can follow up. But uh, one statement that still resonates with me, and I think, really encapsulates the point of this program was that when we learn alongside faculty, we may authentically share our values and empathize with the curiosity, joy, and reticence that motivate their practice. And if you read my research, you'll, though I 
I don't necessarily encourage it because dissertations aren't really written for reading. That said, uh, reticence doesn't have to be pejorative. Reticence is usually the indication that there are some sort of structural barriers that are keeping a faculty member from wanting to share, wanting to be open, wanting to work with others because there's merits to protecting some of their practices. And actually, it's not just faculty members who suffer from that. It's kind of a problem in education. So really quickly, the design of these uh, is a three semester multi-institution and discipline collaboration. We targeted faculty who teach some of Idaho's common general education courses of which there are 43. Uh, we were using OER to learn about open practices with others beyond Idaho. And a lot of this engagement was facilitated with resources from the Open Education Network, the Rebus Foundation, um, press books, and, and a, a variety of others. Part of the formative nature of this experience was finding what we wanted to do and then making sure that we had the right tools or resources or instruction to help us get to our goals. And then ultimately it was just about play. It was remixing and testing and publishing open resources with faculty. And again, I've, I've tried to maintain as much of a commitment as I can in addition to my other duties and I don't regret it. It's been one of the real highlights of an otherwise really difficult year for me. Uh, incentives were extremely modest. We had one-time funding from our legislature. This constituted a $2,500 stipend for faculty to attend at least one professional learning opportunity. A perk about the pandemic is a lot of these professional learning opportunities became free or low cost or virtual. So there were a lot more that folks could do. Uh, formal recognition. This was something that I thought was really important, especially because we've been tackling access and affordability related uh, policies at the state level in Idaho. And so formally recognizing that these faculty are institution leaders and state leaders in these topics is critical. And by extension of that, this was also a unique opportunity for them to gain access, not only to conversations that are happening statewide, but to emerging tools and also involvement on a variety of other initiatives we were working on. And, and Abbott specifically, I think has been involved in every initiative that we've run in the board office in the last 15 months. So we have a number of panelists today, but we also had some contributors to this conversation. Um, Amy, Liza, and Joel. I don't know why it says Eliza, apologies, Liza. Uh, they were working on an English uh, OER project. Becca, who's not here today, but um, her colleague Franzi were working on a German um, open project. And Anne, Mike, and Jessica were working on math. And now we're gonna, Stop listening to me. We're going to cut over to our panelists who are going to tell us a little bit more about their projects. And so first question, what projects did you develop as part of this fellowship and why did you or your group pursue this specific project? And I can call on you if you need me to prompt. Do you, I, I can go first. Sure. So Francie Borders from Boise State and uh, Becca and I developed a grammar book that accompanied the Deutsch im, uh, Deutsch im Blick that's already available OER. We just didn't really like the grammar part of it and the examples because there were two like high school, they had fairy tales. So we wanted, because we uh, teach German 101 and 102. So we wanted to make more modern. So we did that grammar um, part for Deutsch und Blick and uh, we've been using it. Becca used it for uh, the fall and then in the spring, I used it in the spring. And we always dreamed of making a book of our own. So that was the first step. The next step is uh, kind of modernize the Deutsch und Blick part. And um, yeah, that was the reason. And we were really uh, appreciative and grateful that we got that opportunity to final do make our own book. And we've really enjoyed it. And I think students uh, enjoyed it. And it's been so far really successful. Thanks, Ramsey. Mm -hmm. How about the math group? What'd you work on and why? So uh, with the math group, uh, we initially uh, wanted to make a um, pre-calculus level textbook for uh, non-STEM majors, uh, something that could go beyond just the basic algebra uh, that, you know, humanities and, you know, physical therapists and things like that were asked to do. And 
get into more of a hands-on conceptual understanding of math rather than the uh, procedural understanding that so many textbooks tried to work on. Um, you know, we hit some, some roadblocks here and there. Uh, our scope kind of got way too big at one point and we had to scale it back. But uh, on the whole, I think we ended up with a very uh, useful um, starting point of a workbook with several um, experiments and projects that could be done in class in a day as homework over a weekend or maybe even long term over the entire term. And do you have anything to add to, to Mike's points? Yes, I would like to add that um, one of our goals, uh, Mike started talking about this, but we wanted to start from the application of the math. And in some ways, sometimes very complex math. And then through our activities and projects work backwards to the theoretical aspects that most textbooks begin with. So it's really the opposite direction. Uh, and through some pilot work in a couple of different classes that we ran at the University of Idaho, uh, very successful in terms of um, student understanding and their engagement in the material. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, Mike. English group, bring us home. Tell us about your project. This is Liza Long from the College of Western Idaho. Uh, and Amy, Joel, and I worked on creating an open modular, we hesitate to call it a textbook. We think of it more as a living resource. It's called Write What Matters. And we based it on the Idaho State Board of Education written communication outcomes, because we wanted a tool that would be modular that uh, instructors across the state in both English 101 and English 102 could use. We also considered, Joel just put our book link in the chat. And we also considered stakeholders uh, ranging from our colleagues to adjunct faculty to dual credit or concurrent enrollment instructors as we were trying to develop this project. Um, we really just wanted a resource that instructors could use in a variety of different ways and that would provide um, a free and high quality resource for our students in Idaho. Joel, Amy, do you have anything to add? I would say with the um, the opportunity to use press books, it, it gave us um, chances to incorporate multimedia. And also, um, I think what's really neat about our textbook is that it's for students, but also for instructors. And so we did give um, actual assignments and rubrics that instructors could use. So we wanted it to be as practical as possible in, in so that an instructor doesn't have to, you know, search and find all over the internet, but we can provide those resources to them quite easily. I'll, I'll just kind of add to what Amy said right there about being for other instructors as well. I, to me, that was one of, the, one of the really interesting takeaways from this project. And I'm going to drop the link in the chat here to the Idaho State Board of Education competencies for written communication. And this is kind of like in our organizing principle. So what's really interesting about Idaho is that all the higher ed institutions share the same competencies for written communication. And what's really interesting when you, is when you have conversations with, you know, the writing instructor at BSU or Lewis Clark or ISU um, and then CWI, and you compare how they interpret some of these outcomes, it's very different. Like how they teach them is fascinatingly, which is not a word, but it's very different. Um, and so we wanted to kind of use these as a way to or in some ways leverage these outcomes as a way to be able to share and foster, and foster collaboration. Um, and I, one of my takeaways, I think, you know, maybe we'll have another question that this is more appropriate for, but one of my takeaways was uh, that these state outcomes actually became a way for empowerment and sharing rather than like codification, which is kind of, you know, a little bit paradoxical, but actually worked out quite nicely. It's nice to hear because when I'm writing policy, I like to hope that it's a matter of setting standards, not standardization. And I will say specifically to the English project that I used to teach first year writing at Boise State. And the sort of project that they tackled is exactly the sort of project that multiple departments across the state had been talking about, at least for, for multiple years. 
And this was an excuse to work on it. And to, to emphasize a couple points that I observed from all the groups presenting on this, this question, uh, that's just it, this was an opportunity. This was the excuse or that push that they needed in order to tackle some of the projects they wanted to, to focus on. And also importantly, um, emphasizing some that we established really early on as a cohort that we don't know what done is in the context of open resources. And that doesn't stop us from actually using these materials in our classes and iterating with our students and with other faculty. Next question. How have your practices as an educator evolved during the fellowship? And I recognize that I can't credit the fellowship with all of your evolution over the last year. We, we did face a pretty interesting and unique time in education, but how has the, the fellowship itself influenced some of your work now? I'll, I'll start with this one. Um, so because our guiding principle were the general education um, written communication outcomes. Um, I felt like sometimes in the classroom when, especially when we give the syllabus on the first day, we read the, the learning outcomes and they can seem sort of vague and um, how does this actually pertain to what it is that we're doing? And because we um, set up the book um, with those ideas in mind, I think it really helped to just sort of cement the different ways in which the learning outcomes um, connect to objectives, connect to the textbook, connect to the actual assignments. And so I felt like there was just more of a thread that uh, just sort of tied everything um, more cohesively together and that actually made my teaching better because I was able to then refer to the readings and um, things like that to kind of, um, you know, ensure that students are understanding things. Also, um, I think that um, I was able to see gaps in my own teaching or in the um, instruction that I was doing, you know, students were struggling with certain things. And you know, I was like, I need a book for that. So this is the perfect opportunity to incorporate chapters or activities, um, lessons, um, videos that would help to sort of bridge those gaps that I personally saw with my own students and um, or that I had struggled to try to find um, good resources prior. Thanks, Amy. And I, I should say, I think all the other questions are for individuals. And so you don't have to uh, self-select by group now. It's, this is free game to anyone who wants to answer this question. I'll go ahead. Uh, I loved everything Amy said because I really related to that. I felt like uh, this empowered me as an instructor. Uh, it really made me a participant and reinforced a lot of the lifelong learning needs that I have as an instructor where I was having to actively engage with the content that I was both creating and teaching. And then the other way that it really transformed my teaching last year is that I started to bring students into the creation of OER. So I didn't actually use this as much in English 101 and English 102, but in my English 211 literary analysis class, my students created their own press book. I was able to take the knowledge that I learned through the fellowship and have the students actually create a critical edition of the short stories that they studied. And uh, just the knowledge that they would be published and have a publication credit uh, really upped their game in terms of what they produced. And it also be, has become part of what I would think of as assignments are now not one and done, but they're renewable, right? So I now have this uh, collection of student assignments that can become part of a renewable assignment. I anticipate that this volume will grow each, each term as students continue to con um, contribute and create their own OER. Thanks, Lisa. And I appreciate you citing that ripple effect too that's had on some of your other classes, because of course the, the key component here is you. <laughs> It's not the individual classes. Um, any other thoughts on this question? I have one I'd like to share. Um, I'm enough older than my students. In many ways, I don't feel like I can connect with what's important to them, what they enjoy, what might pique their interest. And in working through um, piloting some of the exercises that we developed, I feel like I 
I must have just suddenly been able to hear them and, and listen to them. Um, I wanted us to be working on something that would be very inclusive to anyone, any kind of a student that we might have. And I had no idea all of the things that I needed to incorporate with that and, and how to um, encourage them to show me and to let me know. Um, so I, I just felt like all of a sudden my eyes were opened. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. And we can move on to the next question if uh, Franzi or, or Joel or Mike, you don't have anything that you want to contribute. Uh, nothing new anyway. All right, fair enough. I, I, I'll just add real quick, um, just to build on Wise and Amy's comments that uh, I think this was kind of mentioned, but I just want to reinforce it. it, it it, there's a really fascinating like feedback loop that happens when you teach with OER and and I guess the model that Jonathan facilitated for us and uh, really encouraged like just constantly revisiting the project as we taught right and and it evolved I mean beginning it started during COVID or just before COVID and kind of continued throughout so we, so we kind of developed a, a strong relationships we would share our classroom experiences. We would then use those experiences after we had an initial draft and, and pilot and beta pro a product. We would share experiences and then go back and, and revise, correct certain chapters, add certain content. And I mean, just the other week, I emailed Liza, uh, Liza and, and Amy. I was like, hey, like I'm thinking about revising this chapter and teaching it this way this semester. Do you have feedback? And they just gave me feedback on the draft. And so I'm going to build those into the next um, the next version of it and it, i mean it's really kind of a compositionist model of both teaching and i think just textbook where you're constantly assembling and constantly revising and uh, yeah I, I just find it really transformative for for me as an instructor just really extremely tra transformative thanks joel friends are you good to move on sure i mean it's everything that all great stuff that <laughs> i agree to yep well, great, uh, because naturally, I think some of your answers also start hitting at this question. So how has your work in the fellowship changed your relationship with students, faculty, and others? And others, I think about some of the people who might be in our audience today, uh, librarians, instructional designers, technologists, other folks who are on campus. But also, importantly, and, and this has been something that I've really wanted to do a better job of showcasing at the state level, uh, is, it, is it or has it changed some of your relationships with the general public and those who are outside of education, um, because I think that that's an important opportunity for all of us as we pursue open education. I can speak specifically to librarians, Jonathan. I was thinking you mentioned your office hours, which have really been so great to have. I know we've popped in sometimes just to ask quick questions, but uh, I hopped into one of your office hours sessions a few weeks ago and the, the very person I needed to speak with was also in the session, Ryan Randall, one of our amazing CWI librarians. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing as I take my knowledge forward has been in collaboration with Ryan uh, as we've worked to get CWI's Pressbooks account set up. Um, and also the relationships that I've had with Joel and Amy. Joel really touched on how um, we now have this little learning community, right? So that when I have a question about pedagogy or I, I need some help with something, I feel really open and reaching out. I mean, Amy's at a different institution. So building those cross institutional relationships has been just fantastic. Um, I, I think those have been the, the biggest ways that the fellowship has changed my relationship. I, I was intrigued by your question about outside of, uh, outside of academia because I'm curious about that. I have actually shared the book. Um, <laughs> I've shared it with a few people and it's really funny because people say, that's fantastic. How much does it cost? And I say, oh, it, it's open. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. So uh, that's that's been delightful. The first person I thought of right away was my mother. She was just thrilled. But she said, but, but how much does it cost? How do I pay you? So if you don't, it's open. So. Well, and for your group in particular, you also found some new relationships, I think, with um, faculty in other places, um, sometimes really far away places. Yeah, I think there's like, I, I guess that's one of my takeaways too, is um, 
we would get feedback from like someone reached out to me on LinkedIn, others, they would drop in feedback on our official Google form that we link to, I believe in the introduction to our textbook. And so, yeah, we get just kind of feedback from different institutions outside of Idaho and saying like, hey, this is how I'm using your chapter. Like, I'm, I'm really good in this particular area. Can I, you know, can I add something on film analysis, right? And so we we're kind of just benefiting from expertise elsewhere, but it's also fascinating. We had someone reach out to us from, from Ireland, kind of a CTE um, version in, in Ireland, um, Ireland. So it was not a genetic course. It was, I think, just training. It was training people in like technical, expertise like tr trucking mechanics something like that and they were using one of our one of our parts on reflective practitioners um and so there was this really fascinating i guess collaboration going on and kind of i think translation of one of our chapters in ways repurposing one of our chapters that's that's part of what we are repurposing one of our chapters within their institution and to me that's like what writing is all about is seeing that kind of transfer takes place take place and so just to develop these relationships that encourage that um, is really cool to watch. And I can add for the German program, just the collaboration. It was just Becca and I, but it was nice that we could work together on a book and then use it. And, uh, and it's always developing that it's not like a textbook that we used before. We couldn't change anything if we felt like we really wanted to change something. So with this book, there, there is, if we feel like something works, then uh, we'll leave it. And if the next semester we feel something better, we can do that. So collaboration, I think is the biggest. We haven't done so much outside yet, so I can't really speak to that, but I hope that it, it will go to the high schools that teach German and um, hopefully you know, worldwide and that they would use it and there's more collaboration going on. And, and importantly, I should mention that um, German is just one of the languages represented by this fellowship. Uh, we also had faculty working on math and on French. And uh, having all three of these groups working together, figuring out even though you know, they were disparate pro projects, they were talking about how to do assessment in their classes. They were talking about pedagogical practices and certain standards. Um, all of them were interested in the active standards uh, to some degree. And, and I can't remember if it was Becca or someone else was talking to me about someone from, from Austin actually reaching out and wanting to know more about the project because it had a relationship with, with resources that they had created as well. Um, Anne and Michael, I, I know that you had a, I think you had an established relationship at some point. Did, did I hear at one point, Mike, that you had even taken classes from Anne as a student? Yeah. Um, I was a graduate student at the University of Idaho, uh, where Ann teaches, and um, I did work um, alongside her, uh, helping out in the Polya Mathematics Lab, um, which uh, she is, I think, currently the director of. Um, so, you know, she was uh, kind of a, a mentor to me while I was at the University of Idaho. And it was just really uh, a great opportunity to work alongside her again. Can I, can I just add one thing about the relationship that I did not expect to appreciate as much as I did, which was our relationship to the, the state, State Board of Education. I, I felt like that was one of the most impactful parts of this project, this fellowship, was feeling like there was a feedback loop between um, our classroom, our individual classrooms, our, our pedagogy, and then in our, like Jonathan mentioned, reticences, <laughs> right? These reticence, reticences that we would share during COVID and, and even now, and just work through, you know, exigencies would be another term we could throw out there and saying like, hey, this is what we're facing. Here's a problem. Um, as it relates to OE, this specific project, like, can we get your input, Jonathan? And he would just provide a different perspective that I had not appreciated before. And knowing that the state like had our ear, or we had the ear of the state, sorry, and he, um, this institution was there to facilitate and provide support for faculty, just was extremely encouraging and extremely motivating, personally. 
I, I appreciate that, Joel. And, and you're buoyed by two factors. One is that the member of the state board office that you're working with is a, is a real gossip who um, likes to be honest at all times so he doesn't have to remember anything more than he has to. And so we definitely talked a lot about uh, the, the sort of systemic factors and politics and issues at play as we were navigating the last uh, 15 odd months together. But also, um, I'll say that it, it cuts both ways in terms of how it's changed my relationship and that, uh, one, I had a relationship with the research that was undergirding a lot of this project and my own experience as a faculty member and as someone who's worked in faculty support for a long time, that you know, surely this would work if I could find the bandwidth to be present in the way that I want to be present. And it is very helpful that this is the first job I've had that I've worked in in open ed for at least a decade now. This is the first job I've had that actually has responsibilities related to OER and open education in the job description. Um, but furthermore, I was very concerned when I made the transition from was a faculty support role at one of our institutions to a state level administrative role, um, even though it was in academic affairs, because I really prized my relationships with my fellow faculty. And I was concerned that I would have a bigger platform and a bigger reach and not be able to do anything with it because um, I wouldn't be able to earn the trust and the support of faculty. And I think that that's something that for me, it's happening at the state level or that concern exists at the state level and no longer exists, at least with this group. Uh, but I've seen it at institutions as well. I've talked to librarians who um, are even faculty within their libraries and they often feel concerned or, or they feel defeated or they feel that they can't engage with faculty in um, sort of peerhood terms. And I, I think the important thing, the important thing here is if you have common values and shared affinities and work that is bound to those things, um, you can find that common appreciation with one another. And so thank you all for, for taking a chance on this because I think early on, um, a, a relationship I saw, which was not surprising for me because this is how students would uh, navigate some of my more creative assignments and classes as well, is I would impose guardrails, but not all the guardrails that one would expect. And so there's even that relationship with what is professional development supposed to be and what are, where are the learning outcomes? What are we supposed to produce at the end? I think that was a question I got from most people multiple times in the first month is, yeah, but like, what are we on the hook for? Like, what do we have to do? And I said, you have to be here and, and you have to produce work that you're gonna find value in and meaning in and ultimately you need to find the, um, the fortification that you need to feel like you're a leader in this space. And I, I'm biased, but I consider all of you to be um, not only emergent, but emerged leaders in the state of Idaho as it relates to open education. And it's great too, because I knew some folks before the fellowship as well. Like I knew Joel um, and we, we used to just ask back, co-faculty talk casually about using technology in their classes. And I got to see a lot more of those sorts of conversations between faculty and, and between new faculty that I never met before with me. And it was, um, it's a very community driven program. So next is, I'm sorry, did someone say something? Okay. What motivates you to keep exploring open resources and practices? But I think we've touched on this kind of periodically in answer to the questions. Um, and I, I asked this question because one of the uh, starkest moments for me was really early on when the pandemic hit Idaho because it felt like everything just kind of screeched to a halt. And the institutions in our state, like I imagine many states, were um, in, a, in a real kind of crisis mode and, and defensive um, position, and there was only so much I could do. Uh, I, what I wanted to do was help, and there's only so much I could do. And then all of a sudden, things got busy at the state level, and here I was. I just started this faculty fellowship two months prior, and I felt like I went MIA for two weeks, and I felt terrible about it. And then we started reconvening with our, our regular meetings, and uh, the, the common feedback that I got from you all is that, oh, I get it. Like I, I understand why, why people use OER. I understand why open education and open practice is useful. Um, and I wonder if any, any of you can speak more to that and why that will continue to be the case after the pandemic has um, concluded because I'm convinced it's not there yet. 
I'll start with this one. I think, first of all, Jonathan, you might rephrase your question um, to how can you possibly stop us from <laughs> continuing to explore this? Um, I had no idea how uh, trapped I was in the handcuffs of publishers. And it is a whole new world has opened up and it, it feels like I was given permission to cover my course material in the way that I think is the best for the students in the right order. And I just, I had no idea uh, what a straitjacket I was in. I'll also um, point out that Anne teaches very large lecture hall classes at University of Idaho, which is our resident um, land grant, R1. So Jonathan, if I could expand a little bit on what Anne said, uh, coming from you know, a, a different perspective, we're at Lewis Clark State College, my classes tend to be around 20 to 25 people rather than the large auditoriums. Um, this opportunity kind of showed me th um, the the writing faculty might uh, know the old saw of if, if you haven't found the story you want to read, write it yourself. Um, it's kind of the idea that if you haven't found the content that you want to teach, make it. And I think as teachers, we all do that uh, to a large extent. And having this opportunity to collect our work and, and share it with the larger uh, teaching community and get input from other teachers, from um, you know, administrators and from students was you know, just seeing that, that product develop and evolve over time was motivation enough to just see where is this thing gonna go? Yeah, you raise a good point, Mike, but I know others have also communicated to me, and, and I know this was true for me when I was teaching classes of students as well. I wrote a lot. I created a lot of things that they just lived and died within my course shell, or you know, I, I had to hope that students were finding them useful. Um, and, and so to find that they could actually have new or additional or transformative life by attaching and uh, Creative Commons license and sharing them with my faculty colleagues and also even having that conversation with students. Um, I know for me as an educator, it was a really transformative moment. I um, sort of felt uh, a lot like my students <laughs> prior to um, embarking on the fellowship a little bit in terms of uh, not being very confident about um, my ability to be published. Um, and so, um, it's been um, a good enlightening journey. Um, I think um, I'm really passionate about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that open provides all the hallmarks of, of that. Whereas like a traditional publishing route is somewhat exclusionary. Um, there are a lot of barriers. And so I really um, sort of embrace all of the, um, the openness of open. Um, and it also, um, makes me think about the different ways in which I can encourage other faculty to engage in open in order to be published because a lot of us aren't doctors we're not PhDs or EDDs or anything like that and um, are not necessarily interested in pursuing that and uh, pursuing uh, for example like scholarly um, articles per se but we are interested in sharing our expertise and knowledge um, in, in what we, we kind of know. And so I think, um, you know, just um, a few weeks ago, we use Canvas and um, right now our college doesn't allow us to publish on Canvas Commons. And so, you know, I uh, queried my supervisor and said, hey, can we make this happen? Because this is really a great opportunity to have other faculty publish assignments or even, you know, parts of, uh, chapters or whatever it is that they want um, and add that to their uh, to their CV. And so again, yeah, it's just that um, I feel um, more empowered, I guess, with open and I just want to keep going with that. 
I, I know for me, um, Jonathan, you mentioned how this kind of started right before the pandemic. And um, this was the one thing that stayed normal <laughs> in my life, uh, where we had those meetings with Joel and Amy, and we were able to really have something to center and focus on. But when I think about the where I am now with where I started, when we started this project, I really was full of terror when I got the acceptance to the Opal Fellowship. I thought, oh my goodness, what have I signed up for? I'm gonna have to write a freaking open education textbook because I didn't understand at all what open was. So when I think about what motivates me, I think about being able to learn more about open, go find the Gagich textbook that we relied very heavily on and a few others, uh, WAC from Colorado, um, finding uh, Creative Commons. Amy and I both were able to do the Creative Commons licensing course as part of our professional development. And every step that we took, it, I started to realize, you know, I tell my students that writing is part of being a conversation and open education is a conversation. And now I get to be part of that conversation. So I am thinking as I reflect on this question, just how grateful I am for all of the amazing high quality resources we already had access to that we could incorporate into our book, centering them around the Idaho state outcomes. Thanks, Liza. Thanks, Amy. Uh, you both set me up with a really great segue to the, the fifth and final question I have for you all. So, Franzi, I hope it's, you don't mind if we move on to that one. You're good. All right. So at the end of the day, this was a faculty learning opportunity. This was a program that was supposed to facilitate learning um, for you all on a specific topic that, uh, at least personally, I know I value that our state board values that actually all of your institutions value as well. What do you expect now from future faculty learning opportunities, whether they're statewide or at your institution? What common features do you expect? Everybody's quiet, I'll talk. I, I'm hoping that we'll have the opportunity to share, Jonathan, I guess this is a larger conversation, but we as the first uh, cohort of OPAL leaders will have the opportunity to share what we've learned in some kind of fashion with faculty around our state and maybe beyond that, because I, I'm so excited now about the possibilities of open education, uh, everything everyone said about how it's transformed my pedagogy, my relationship with my students and my uh, feeling of myself as a member of a learning community. And I want other faculty to experience that same freedom. So I hope with future faculty learning opportunities, uh, we can somehow be a part of that and um, helping to share what we've learned. I see someone. I see someone um, who was going to make a note about like resources as being really relevant to future faculty learning opportunities. That was another unexpected takeaway from this whole um, "quote unquote" free <laughs> OER project. Was like, yeah, it took funding to get the grant off the grounds. Rebus um, has an, an amazing platform for, for facilitating the, these kinds of programs. It, it costs money. Uh, Pressbooks is itself free to use, but then to take advantage of the more sophisticated um, versions of it, you do need a institutional. We, we ended up adopting the statewide subscription. I think Jonathan um, facilitated that as well. All this stuff costs a lot of money. H5P, again, like these are subscription costs. And so I think one thing that I discovered from this process is like, hey, you do need serious resources to get this kind of stuff off the ground. And once those are in place, it does amazing things. But that initial investment is really important. And so I think one thing that I you know, would hope to see from future faculty learning opportunities is knowing that there's a foundation and infrastructure that's going to make sure that it continues when we're done with the learning experience, whatever that might be. Yeah, I appreciate you highlighting the technology, Joel, because um, at least in my experience, when I was working at the institutions doing faculty support, it was often because we had some sort of new technology solution or platform. And so we were trying to teach to that solution and how to use it. And an important design of this program was that we didn't really have the tools on hand to start. Instead, what we had was conversation about what it is that we wanted to do. And it, it doesn't hurt that I'm a technologist and I'm fairly familiar with technology that, that aligns well with open practice, but it was really through the needs of the faculty that we were working with in the program that we decided that, yes, we should get press books. And then we actually found an avenue to get press books for every institution in the state. 
And then, um, it, as Joel mentioned, H5P, the math group wanted a different LaTeX editor than that, which is native in Pressbooks. And all of these things were, were things we could accommodate because we had a budget, but we hadn't already spent that budget on the tools that we thought were the best in class or that faculty might want to use. Instead, we got the ones that faculty actually needed. And if they didn't need them, they, they stopped using them. That was fine too. And I can add one more thing, which kind of sure. goes with Liza, the collaboration with other faculty um, worldwide and you know, just sharing and uh, finding what they find useful. And um, so I don't have to search um, why. And what I noticed for instance, for Germany, I couldn't find a lot of open educational resources there. So it, it was nice to uh, get a good starting point, so. Thank you all. I see that questions are now coming in from the, uh, the chat. And so I'd like to move to those. Let's see, wait, they both disappeared. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, Jonas asked, does participation in the Rebus community require a subscription? No. So part of the curriculum of this fellowship was attached to the Rebus community's um, textbook success program. We were part of their second cohort and I, going back to the conversation about um, relationships, I do think that those of us who were able to attend very early morning sessions for us being in Pacific and Mountain Time, uh, we really benefited from being able to learn about the open publishing process in a really um, structured way with colleagues, librarians, faculty, administrators in other states and other colleges and universities. And so um, that was the paid component of working with Rebus. That was our partnership. Um, however, we are still working on building out um, the end results of these projects, or at least showcasing these projects in a more formal way with the Rebus community. And it's a great place, I think, that I'm going to be leaning on for continuous improvement of these and other projects we're working on. So I answered that one. Sorry, gang. But this one's for you. Um, I, from Philip Smith, I'm interested in the faculty on the panel have been able to influence colleagues at their institutions and encourage them to explore and use OER and open practices. Have you gotten others hooked? I think so. I, Liza and I were on. I, I was going to respond to this via our experience um, on a curriculum committee. It's really like a, like a composition resource committee um, for English 101, 102. And we recently revised our curriculum for English 101 around the state outcomes, conveniently enough. And so it, it felt like we were getting more buy in. With, with the work we were doing in OER, precisely because we had put so much energy into thinking through these, how to map to these state competencies. And so we, you know, if, and then there are unexpected, um, I think like just uh, connections that we made where we would have conversations about like, oh, how do we, you know, we're trying to be more inclusive with our um, curriculum guide. How do we teach, you know, how, how, do, how do we, I guess, foster an environment where, where peer feedback is more inclusive and students are thinking about um, like standard American English, the the history of that. And then, you know, you, maybe when they read things like appro appropriate grammar, it's like highly qualified and that they understand that the history behind um, how that term came about. Uh, we're like, oh, we, we have a chapter on that. Like we've done all this research. It's part of our textbook. Like here's something you could use to, to you know, kind of knock this out pretty quickly. So I, it just became highly relevant at certain points in our discussions. And I saw you nodding. Have you had an influence on your, your fellow faculty? Yes, uh, some of my colleagues started adopting um, a couple of the projects that we have included in our math resource. And they were pleased with what happened, pleased with how their students received it. So I was just happy about it. <laughs> they they actually want to um, explore joining in with us at some point. So okay. that's also exciting. Yeah, I, I think I should also mention that though the fellowship is is technically over, um, I think everyone I've heard from so far is plans to keep working on their resource and using their resource in, in the future. 
Um, so that creates new opportunities as well to bring in additional collaborators over time. It's one of the perks of focusing on these 43 common index forces that we have in the state is that there are a lot of stakeholders across our eight institutions. Uh, Mike and Franzi, I saw that you both unmuted. I can go ahead, Franzi, you first. Okay, sure. So for German, that hasn't happened yet, but that's the plan that the uh, high schools in the Valley that have German would adopt the book we're teaching with. So that is the plan, hasn't happened yet. It's always a little bit tricky when it's just a big change when you, and you know, some people are more hesitant because they are used to something and this is new, but this is the plan. And uh, I think it looks really positive for that, but we'll, we'll have to see maybe in a year, I know more, but that's the plan. Thanks, Franzi. And I, I know I can speak at least to the Spanish project that uh, there's a similar in many ways. It's based on in press books. It is supposed to function sort of like a textbook, but they really focus a lot on interactive activities for uh, Spanish language testing, just kind of just in time exercises for students using H5P. And my understanding is at least at Boise State that they're talking about making that one of the kind of approved and main resources for Spanish 101, 102. So. Maybe it's just a matter of time. Uh, Mike. So at, uh, at Lewis Clark State College, uh, we tried adopting uh, open resources about five or six years ago, and none of the math faculty were at all impressed with the resources that we found. And it kind of left a sour taste in our mouths for um, open resources in general. And with my involvement in this fellowship and the whole process here, you know, I've really come to appreciate that rather than uh, denouncing open resources in general as not worth the, the, the trouble, it became an opportunity to advocate for either creating the resources that we want or working to improve the resources that were out there to make them. Um, acceptable to make them closer to what we want. And I think, you know, some of the faculty that I've talked to are, are warming up to it, but, you know, it's, it, it, it's still a struggle in some cases because as faculty, we, it's easy for us to get entrenched in what we've always done. But, you know, working on it and, you know, seeing some softening of the edges. And I would say just to those of you who have um, joined us today, Philip, I do really appreciate your question. Uh, the, the group that's here, uh, we actually had more applications for the fellowship than we could honor in the first cohorts. Uh, and it was, it was interesting because it was not for lack of um, not trying in that I think we had a application window of like two weeks and it was, I think launched during the middle of Christmas break. And so it wasn't the most exposed program. That said, um, we had, because the scale was so big across the state um, in terms of who we were looking for, we got a lot of applicants. We were able to land on the, the three projects where we could have a critical mass or three general areas of projects. And what, what materialized, um, and I'm sure you're getting this from the answers of this group today, is a coalition of willing, of, of those who were willing to take a chance to try something new. And you know what, that was a fine place to start. And it's going to be a fine place to continue because I know that there's still others who are willing um, and increasingly more so every day as we grow awareness. And in Idaho, faculty are absolutely critical to that enterprise of trying to build awareness among our academic community about what we are is and how it functions, how it's a means to an end. And that end is ultimately, how do we share better? How do we collaborate better? And how do we disrupt more conventional and restrictive reward structures in higher ed. And with that, I wanna be mindful of time, uh, but I, I do want to um, assure all of you that I have the best collaborators in the world. And this project has been just one of the highlights of my career. And, and I'm also grateful that we actually have recurring funding to launch a new cohort in Idaho in the fall. And many of the folks involved with the first cohort are gonna be involved with that project as well in terms of facilitating. Uh, but we also invite you to collaborate with us. And we have, um, these projects are going to be increasingly featured in our state level press books instance called the Idaho Open Press, uh, as well as in the Rebus community, as we've mentioned. 
But here's some folks to contact. Please contact me anytime. Like I said, this is part of my job. Um, for others in the, the project, it's just part of their passion. So I'm even grateful that we have more than one point of contact for each project. And with that, uh, I really want to thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, Francisca and Michael, Liza, Joel, Amy, and Jonathan. Um, this is a very rich discussion. And so um, I'm very appreciative. I'm, I'm sure our audience is as well about um, our, all your reflection. Um, sounds like you have a great program. You have a fantastic uh, open educator leader at the state level. And sounds like you're all now uh, faculty champions for your institution. So congratulations on your uh, participation in the fellowship. So I want to thank our audience for joining us today. Just to remind you that the webinar, it has been recorded and will be available shortly after the summit um, on the uh, OEN YouTube uh, site for the 2021 summit. Um, keep the conversation going by joining us on Slack. And um, I will drop that link there if you haven't joined Slack yet. And, and if you're an OEN member, we hope you'll continue the conversation in the OEN Google Groups. So again, thank you everyone for today's session and have a great day.